Check. It's on. It's pretty crowded, folks, so why don't you squeeze in and make room for the other folks? <laughs> we can't get you all in one photo. <laughs> What working group is going against us right now? Because this has never been this light before. Dinner. <laughs> I want to chair that working group. I believe the flying home working group is having a very <laughs> vibrant uh, meeting right now. <laughs> Bear with us a minute. This, this MOQ session will feature a hot live demo. Have you ever really looked at your hand? Oh, you're getting you're you're, you're going rogue. <laughs> and now the question: How many video codecs can we use in three laptops? The answer so far is seventeen. <laughs> okay. Do you want me to share the slides and go? Yeah. Okay. Will that kick them off? All right, hello everyone and welcome to session two of Media Over Quick on Thursday evening. Thank you for staying. We promise it'll be worth it. So here we have the IETF note well, it being Thursday. Uh, has anyone attended a session in every block all week and has seen this 16 times? All right, pat yourself on the back. This is important. These are the standards by which we uh, agree to do business here with covering important things like patents, code of conduct, etc. cetera. Uh, please uh, read and abide by them. Uh, meeting tips, we think you've mostly figured it out. Uh, you can join the chat, join the queue. Um, make sure you, you speak into the mic, et cetera. We did day one already. We have a scribe, thank you, Ali. Um, you got the notes open, okay? Okay, great. Uh, if anybody needs uh, something relayed in chat, does somebody volunteer to relay things at the mic? Okay, Ted will do that. Ah, agenda bash to eight. Rebash, so uh, day two. So we're gonna do, uh, uh, we're gonna walk through what the results of this week's uh, interop uh, event were and give uh, implementers a chance to talk a little bit about their implementations, uh, et cetera. And there's a, you may have already gotten a preview of the demo that you're gonna see of mock technology in action. Um, I think uh, we're gonna maybe split from what's on the slide here and we wanna cover uh, issues. We're gonna cover some announced issues first, then let Will talk about catalog and warp and CMAF packaging, and then circle back to parameter reform, and then as time permits. Did I get that right? Okay. Does anyone wish to bash the agenda? You, that's what I said. And now, so yeah, it'll be interop, announce, catalog, C, warp and CMAF, parameters, as time permits. And we have at least one as time permits. Okay, so 
Okay, Will says that it's mostly catalog, but he will use all 30 minutes for catalog-ish. Okay, anybody, any further bashing? Okay. Okay, interop readout. I will see if I can stop those and share. And if you are an implementer and you put slides in the stack and want to come talk about your implementation, come close to your mic or uh, where'd they go? Interop stacks. Can we see it? We're good. Okay, so uh, we uh, got together. I think there were six different implementations. You're gonna hear more about them later. Um, what we've done is set up an, a Google Sheet spreadsheet that shows all the clients and all the servers, which you'll see on the next page. And then if, if you manage to achieve a certain level of interop, one of these test cases, you add that number to your cell, uh, or maybe we'll go, um, some people wanna read bike shed and use letters instead of numbers, but um, right now it's numbers. Uh, and the more interop cases you get, the darker your cell turns. And then, um, you know, if we're doing really well uh, on the current draft, it'll, it'll change to a very dark hue. So covering setup, subscribe, subscribe, okay. Receiving objects, announce, announce, okay. Hints, unsubscribe, go away, and then also a signal of whether you can do uh, rock quick or not, since that is not a common thing yet. Okay, so this is, the, this is where we got to this week. Um, so uh, those are the six implementations, and uh, if you go down the diagonal, that is the implementation talking to itself. So um, fairly good level of interop. People are able to like write applications, that's good. Uh, and we did get some implementations talking to each other and uh, several people got at least as far as four, which is exchanging objects. Um, or maybe that was three, what? Three, sorry, at least three, which is exchanging objects, um, which is exciting when you get your first object. Um, and just to cover a couple of uh, notable results. So between some folks may have already seen Jordy's uh, browser-based uh, live streaming uh, and publisher and viewer uh, so we were able to use that, but through my relay, using totally different code. Uh, and we were able to get a, a nice smooth video stream. He's probably talk about that. Um, Luke has um, for a long time been streaming things at quick.video, but he's uh, up, updated that to uh, Draft01. Uh, and then uh, the Cisco team, uh, uh, has essentially gotten their VC call uh, infrastructure working. They're able to do a VC call using mock Draft01, which was published two weeks ago. So I just want to like, um, highlight that we've got lots of stuff, good stuff going on. So I'll just talk briefly uh, about my implementation, uh, which I'm calling MetaMock for now. Uh, it's written in C++. Uh, it only supports web transport uh, at the moment. It's based on uh, our Proxygen HTTP library and the MoveFast Quick library. Uh, I've got clients, I've got servers, I've got relays, I've got it all. Um, the relay uh, is just generic. You just announce and and subscribe and it just matches announces and announces and subscribers together and he duplicates uh, update upst upstream uh, subscribes. Uh, I implemented uh, an application uh, called which we came up called the mock clock so it just publishes the time once a second and using groups and objects so you can do deltas in the group like it publishes the current time at the beginning of every minute and then every second it just publishes the second. And it supports subscribe hints going back to 1970, so you can historically uh, ask for what, what time it was back then. Um, I also have a chat, which is client server only. It doesn't work through relays yet. Uh, and I have what I, sort of the curl equivalent of mock, which is like a text client. So you can just point that at any track. You just give it a server name and a track name, and it will pull it down and just subscribe to it. So that's what I have. Um, Jordy, you want to just say a word? You want to come to the mic and talk about your implement at all? Or? and it's alphabetical, so I forget who's next. Okay, so thank you. So my implementation is just a publisher that it's a video encoder uh, that runs in a browser. It's a pure JavaScript implementation that uses web codecs uh, to encode the video and audio and uses web transport to uh, basically talk to, uh, to Quick. And, and the MOQ library is just a JavaScript uh, code. And then the player is just the same, but the opposite side. It uses web codecs to decode the video. It uses web, uh, web transfer API to get the messages from the network. And it's a quite, it does a quite complex audio and video alignment uh, algorithm. That's it. Thank cool. You. Thanks, Rudy.
Luke comes next alphabetically. Yeah, uh, I wrote something. It's in Rust. <laughs> it um, it's been up for a while. This has been I've been working on this on the side for maybe six months now. Um, so there's a my main problem was getting rid of a lot of my forks to try and get interop going. Um, but got mostly there. Um, but yeah, it's it streams video. You can watch the quick that video. Um, and there's also a TypeScript implementation. Uh, I think that's the next slide. And uh, Although I think I'm going to be writing that in Rust just because it's going to be more fun. But um, same as Jordy, it's Web Codex. Um, works pretty well. Cool. Thanks. Oh, Martin? Wait. Math. Oh, no. Q R S T. Yeah, Martin before Mathis. I did it right. <laughs> uh, I win. Um, I shall say Victor's written a bunch of code that's relevant to this. Uh, right. It, it's a little less developed, but we had a lead for like six hours, then we were blown away on, on the achievement chart. But um, just web transport right now, just a client, just doing um, Alan's chat. And, and I just want to actually make a pitch for Alan's chat. It, I want... it, it's mock chat. All right, whatever. <laughs> it's, it's um, it, it, yeah, like it, it's cheesy, you know, I'm doing it because I'm lazy and can do it on a command line. But also, like, it's also like a simple version of a, like a VTC model, uh, which is like in our side discussions already come up with a lot of, issues way it subscribes and announces work that are not come from like the regular video consumption. So I would encourage you to like work on that. Um, yeah, so we have chat where like, we're like, I'm implementing messages one by one so I can do like announce and, and subscribe and set up and uh, we'll get objects done very shortly. And actually a server should roll out soon. Uh, Victor's pushing code that we need to merge in. So, yay. Uh, cool, I see Lucas, you're in the queue. Did you have a quick question for someone or you want us to go through? The rest. Okay. Lucas Pardu, uh, maintainer on Cloudflare's quiche. Is this a commitment, Martin? <laughs> yeah, I about that. So, um, uh, Ian, I, I, Ian has stated in the past an intent to fix this, and so like a promise with a with an unbounded like like satisfaction date is well. Actually, why don't you? Yeah, it, someday. <laughs> 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 cool. All right. Thanks, Martin. I, I just I, I did, when I originally added everyone to the slide, I just added their first name instead of an in, in name implementation. So I assume Martin was referring to the maybe the name of the mock library, not the quick library. Anyway, but go ahead, Mathis. Uh, yeah. So my implementation is uh, written in Go. Uh, it supports Quick and Rep Transport on top of Quick Go and Rep Transport Go. Uh, I have a client and a server. You can find the code in the GitHub repository that's links, linked up there. Um, I have a chat application client and server. And just before this session, I tried to connect to Alan's chat and I could at least get a setup and the first objects. And then we had some catalog issues, but I think we'll figure out that one too, soon too. Uh, and I made a little clock application that works, I think, similar to Alan's, which just publishes objects every second. Um, and yeah, then there's a GStreamer video streaming application, which is not completely up to date to the latest version of the uh, library, of the transport library, uh, that just integrates GStreamer into Go and uh, publishes a video stream. But it's very simple at the moment, and I will extend that in the future. All right, cool. Thanks. All right, sue us. Please. Okay, do I need, I need to stop? I didn't see it yet. Oh, there we go. How do I do it? Oh, there we go. We should grab the mic. Okay. So can people see Colin there? So this is a live um, uh, two-way video call happening. If you want to re see the real latency of 150 milliseconds, you should see on my laptop. Um, MeetEcho is just adding more latency. They have to go to mock as well. So that's the thing. So this is, Colin, can you wave hands? <laughs> Start next day. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, Mead Hako and the projector system are not helping our cause here, but yes. um, why don't you go ahead and talk a little yeah. bit about it? Yeah, I gotta kick you out of this. You maybe need to stop. Okay. Can you stop sharing your screen? And... Uh, lost track of where we were. Uh, cool. That's the video call uh, we showed. It's going from here to London and back on Akamai server that Will was um, happy to share with us. And we got um, 160 milliseconds is the latency that we measured. Um, next slide, please. So quicker, we've been working within Cisco. There's a small team of um, enthusiastic developers who believe in this technology, and we've been working on it for a while. Uh, so as part of this week's hackathon, uh, we wanted to kind of uh, adopt it to kind of use mock. So this is a C++-based client uh, and relay. It uses raw quick uh, based on Christian's uh, Pico quick. And as endpoints, what we have is a Mac client, which can, all, you can also build an iOS client, but Mac client, which is sending H264 or 1080p and 720p at two different uh, simulcast resolutions. And we have 48 kilohertz opus. And for transport modes, we provide two today. One is we wanted to play with the extremes here. One is the stream per track, which is audio and video on the two videos will get three tracks totally. And also three streams and datagram is using the quick datagrams there. And on relay implementation, we do have uh, object caching. And we also mark objects with TTL for exploration. If the object is cannot be served within the real time constraints of what we define, the objects get dropped. That's how the holes get created. And we also have priorities. So that way we know um, HD is probably slightly less important than the uh, 720p, for, for example. As a catalog server, we have a conference server that does basic catalog, which is not the catalog that uh, we are working in the ITF yet, but it can be easily converted to the, that one. And in terms of what features from Mock01 that we support are announce, all flavors of announce, all flavors of subscribe, and setup. Um, and what we are missing or deviating is we don't yet support uh, Mock catalog and go away message and subscribe hints. And one deviating thing that we deviate from the standard is that right now, uh, for most of the video calls, we don't need the original uh, uh, publisher to wait for a subscribe to come through because the publishers are coming across the world. They don't even, I uh, don't, uh, having a subscribe come to them to publish adds up join latency. We want to get to the point of zero join latency. That's, that's the hope. And that's something we would like to bring it to the working web at some point because it's also a real use case. Yeah, that's it from Cisco. Great. Um, I just want to say uh, we had a lot of fun to all the implementers. I think we had a great time hacking this week. We, and so much progress was made, and uh, it's just super exciting. And so thanks, everybody, for your hard work. And um, you know, let this keep us energized through the months ahead where we have to just talk about issues. <laughs>
um, where for some reason, I don't know, ran out of quick stream, it hit the max quick stream ID limit or something, and it wants to reconnect and keep things live. So for it, it may want to announce a second time while there's still an active announce there. So any questions on the scenarios that we're trying to deal with? Okay, next slide. Oh, yeah, go back, maybe. Sorry, I didn't get in the queue correctly, but I think on the, the on the first scenario there too, um, I think it's in, important to include that client one and client two are not publishing the same object. They're publishing different groups or ob ob object names. Right? Oh, That's, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That, I'm not sure if that was captured in the um, issue or not. And I'm sorry if I or, or maybe we, you know you can discuss both cases. Or whatever, but okay. I, mean, I think that that's an important distinction as we I, dig into this a little. I more. think yeah. the way that I would design that, and I, I recognize that we've created a lot of new constructs and namespaces and names and objects and groups so that that are, application design using those constructs is still evolving. But I think I'm, what I might do there is extend the namespace. So if client one wanted to publish um, track one and client two wanted to publish track two, you could make their namespaces be different in some way, or like add another differentiator in the namespace, and then you wouldn't have this problem, if that makes sense. Because our current announce message does not allow you to announce anything other than a namespace. So you can't match on any component of the track name, only the namespace name. And if you look at the mock chat design, where I've done some namespace design and I've sort of thought about this and how, the, how I can get the announces routed the way I want or the subscribes and you, you, you need to think a little bit about what your namespaces are. Will? Yeah, I just, we, we might brush aside this use case where client one and client two are publishing identical objects and you say, well, why would that happen? But that's, a, that's what I spent my afternoons pulling me away from my <laughs> ITF today is redundant publishers for high priority events like mm. the Super Bowl. You don't, you're not going to trust one client, right? You're going to have two encoders that are time synced producing content. We need to build into the standard some ability with agreement that they can both publish binary equivalent versions of content and somewhere you can announce it twice and a relay says, well, if I can't get it from the one or something's weird or it's timed out, I can go to the other. I think that's important if we want this to be used in production. That is a great point that I had not thought of, but I could, think there's- Before you leave, Will, can I ask you a clarifying question? Uh, when you say binary equivalent, I assume the codecs and everything are the same, but if they're two different encoders, uh, is it always gonna be the case that you're expecting the input streams going into the encoders for that to be exactly the same? Yeah, inputs probably SDI with Scuddy Marcus okay. or something and, like and that. So, and I, I so expect... you, you, we don't need to worry about semantic equivalence where they've got two different feeds. That's completely different. We're just talking about. Um... There's nuances here. It's a high requirement, but if they're binary equivalent, that's one case. If they're okay. kind of close to each other and we could switch over in a failure situation and not fail completely with a much lower requirement uh, for synchronization between them. That's okay. also I'd... a practical use case that we should consider. Okay, and I think that goes back to whether it's the same object or the same namespace, because clearly the second one would be the same namespace, but not a binary Same namespace, but probably like backup and primary. But at some point in the network, we need a standard for saying these are alternates for one another. Okay, thank you. Okay, I, I see the, the queue growing, so we'll, we'll go through it, but I think that it's a, 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 an option. I think, I'm not sure this was discussed on the issue, but I think it should be a valid option to have relays that allow more than one announce and keep a priority list. But the question is, is that something that needs to be standardized or is it something that we can have it be, um, in, you know, implementation configuration? Um, so think about that. Ian, or Ian. Yeah. Ian Speck, Google. I, I just want to support that that's actually an important use case. And I mean, we've done that multiple times for multiple events uh, and I had as many as four like feeds uh, and they are sometimes like two of them are Bitwise identical to each other and the other two are different. Like there's a whole number of use cases, but like at least supporting the, the bitwise identical but two publishers for redundancy is, is actually an important use case. And I think it should be done at the transport layer. I think doing it at a higher layer adds complexity because it's not so dissimilar from the crash case. So I have locked the queue, um, but that's just because we haven't gotten off the, the question slide. I'll unlock it when we get to the proposed answer <laughs> slide. Okay. I, uh, Jordi, uh, Mera. I also support the use case. I don't know, so I agree with Alan, I don't know if it has to be in the transport layer or above, but definitely uh, having a method, uh, 
a feature that can switch between two streams, I think it's, uh, it's very important. Also, I would be extremely careful in uh, when say bi binary equivalent, that it's not always true. Because two same feeds, the, they can be equivalent chunks, but not binary equal. So just, just. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, Suhas. No, he's after the lock. Oh, you see us is after the lock. Okay, great. Okay, move to the next slide. Here are some options we can talk about and we can reopen the queue. Um, so uh, these options don't have to be mutually exclusive. These are some choices we could make. So one, you can say something like the last announce always wins. Um, we can just say, tell people if you don't want two clients to show up with, and advertise the same namespace, you can do that via how you issue authorization tokens. Um, and if you, run into problems because two people are showing up saying they both are authoritative for the same content and you didn't want that, then you shouldn't have done that. Um, we can also just make it an error and, or add in an error that when two people announce the same, someone you try to announce something, someone else shows up, tries to announce the same thing. You just say, I'm sorry, there's a conflict and you can't, your announce is gonna fail. Um, and that may have implications for how make before break works. Um, but I think, I definitely think there's an option for here, which is you just allow a list and, of some kind and this relay just gets to pick among them either in some proprietary way or we need to define a way to give the relay information about how to select among them. So talk amongst yourselves. I'm <laughs> Colin. Um, so I would, what? propose a, a fourth option here, which is allow it. Um, so assume that they're both author, assuming they're both have valid authorizations. And by the way, I'm not necessarily tied to it. There's a one-to-one -one that every, the idea that every namespace has a different credential, I'm not fully bought into, but it has a valid credential for that namespace. Um, however, the credentials work, well, that's a different set of issues, but we have a, both, if both clients have a valid credential for the namespaces, um, you know, uh, there you assume the application knows what it's doing, and if one client publishes object one and the other client publishes object two, um, people who are subscribed get object one and get object two. And if both clients publish object three, this is where I get sideways on this, then I'm in the all bets are off, who knows what happens. Uh, some everybody will get one of those two threes, and if they're the same, that's fine. If they're not the same, all bets are off. Can I ask a clarifying question about before any objects come anywhere, the relay would have to issue subscribes? So, I actually don't know. Okay, what the I, I, of that Suhas is, told but, me that's not yeah, how it works. But let's just say they do. No let's problem. say they do. Would, are you saying the relay would? This is my clarifying question. Would send would subscribes the, to both? Would yes. it send subscribes to both? I yep. mean, I think if a relay wants. The question is, how much of, do we need to have normative language in the standards that defines? a way oh, for right. all relays to handle this. No, we've got to be very clear on which one of these were coming down. Like if somebody building an application has to know what the relays choose between any of these options we have to do. We have to say what the relay network as a whole does. We don't have to define how relays are built, but we have to say what its characteristics are, right? Um, and I mean, you, you know, maybe you could have some way of negotiating what type of relay it was or something like that, I'm not arguing, but I'm just, I'm throwing out there that, you know, allow it is actually a fairly valid option. We certainly could design that if we wanted. Okay, thanks. I, I mean, our, obviously our current implementation works that way, but I'm not, I, I'm not, it's a different question of like which one we should have, but. All right, great, Well, Yeah, I would actually have option four, which is first authorized announce wins, right? So the first one in to authorize, wins, the IM millisecond says we're authorized. The second one says gets an error. That's, or, that's or, option three. Announce error namespace con. Okay, so I would go with that. I like Cullen's idea for, because that would give primary and backup. They're both valid and they could both say, hey, I'm here. But I really worry about what you do with the subscription because then both clients should then start producing and now I got to dedupe at the relay. And I think that's confusing. So if mm. we can figure if out. Cullen wants to write that relay, I guess it's, well, he can. This has been here. Deduping at the relay turns out to be insanely trivial, okay? Because you already have a cache on the relay and you're like, do I already have this object? Drop it on the floor well, when, when, the, when, when two objects arrive, right? And that's why I said very clearly, if both people publish, ob if both sides publish objects that are different, okay, the deduping algorithm is going to drop one of them on the floor. But if they were publishing up to different relays, 
different relays due to timing conventions and how the data flowed through the net through the relay network may result in different things winning so what but what i'm saying I mean, i've always viewed this is a name data networking problem right so i'm saying that for a given object if two clients publish the same object with different data there's no guarantees about which any of the subscribers will get other than each subscriber will only get one copy of it that's i think it. we're screwed if they do that yeah that's <laughs> like you're screwed if you do that that's nuts that's crazy talk right but the idea of deduping is trivial because it's just like do i have it in my cache if so i already have it can i qualify that it's trivial if they're the same relay but if i want redundancy i'm going to have one relay in new york city yep. and another one in boston and now my dedupe has to work across those two. And I don't think that's trivial. That becomes a time and distance. Uh, okay. I, I, do that's do a, we want to go back to the queue or do you have a quick response? Uh, yeah, a quick response to that. I, totally. That's what I was trying to say. As long as they publish the same data, that's both of them, are, you're going to go to two different relays. By definition, you're trying to do redundancies, right? And those are, those are going to flow through some way that your relay mesh works, which is out of spec of this document, right? And different relays are going to end up, let, let me call these two copies primary and backup, right? Different relays are going to end up with primary or backup, but any given relay that ever gets a copy can trivially dedupe to whichever one it got first for whatever timing mechanism it used for getting one first. And if it never gets one, it will get filled in from the other relay network. Um, everybody's sort of doing that cache and the end subscribers will do that. So the, in the clients that, rel that relate, whether they got a copy from the primary or backup, they'll never really know and it won't really matter and it might change for different clients or different things. But as long as the same, you have the same data on the primary backup, or at least you don't care which copy you got because it's so close. I mean, the video codec stuff, it might not be bitwise exact, but the whole GOP sequence is fine no matter which one you got. Um, I, like, this is a pretty easy, I, I think when you, if you go, if people implementing relays go back and think about how their relay implementations work, you'd come to like, oh, actually, that doesn't really change my relay implementation at all. Okay, but, so I will point out that we have now chewed through the first half hour, and we've gotten through less than one issue. Uh -oh. So uh, we got to speed it up. There are a lot of people in queue. We've got Ian, Suhas, Victor, Luke. Uh, please make it crisp. Um, and uh, then we're going to have to figure out how to get to the second issue, possibly with no resolution. Ooh. Okay, yeah, I think we should just allow... Uh, Duplicates, and I, I was going to suggest you throw a number in there, and that like is a tiebreaker, and it's like DGP or something, right? Like if they're equal, then you can choose or whatever. But like if you want a preference order, let the application choose how to do that, and just throw a bar into there and let it. But I don't really care. But I think we should need to allow. What was the last thing you said? We need to allow. Allow more than one. Yes. Okay. Sorry. I mean to speak too loud. Okay. Uh, I, I agree. We need to allow announces, uh, duplicate announces, uh, and that, uh, for example, from the implementation experience, we do dedupe in our relay. Uh, that's like three lines of code change, and also in our relay network that we set up, we have a meshed peer. We do get duplicates from different paths. The same five lines of code will apply there as well, and this provides the use cases that Will was talking about, and also the make before a break use case. Okay. So uh, it's fine. I, mean, I think I'm just hearing. I mean, I think I heard Will say it's probably good to define this error, and if if some relay wants to throw it, it can. But also, we should totally not forbid, or we don't require this error to be thrown. If your relay can handle more than one announce, then you can handle more than one announce, and it's up to you to figure out how to make it work. Right, right. If if the, if the authorization allows, definitely allow it. If the relay policy allows that, you know, you cannot allow two namespaces, then allow it. It's not totally application and relay decision. But at the mock transport level, it just allows it. Okay. Uh, who's next? Victor. Uh, the thing I was going to point out is, uh, for it, for the chat, is that there are two aspects here. One is when you're a publisher and you announce what kind of behavior can you expect. And the other is how do you, as a relay, uh, approach the problem of, of, back, uh, of filling your cash? Uh, and we should do some, I, I think both option one and option four are valid behaviors for the relays. Uh, and option four can be more complex, but can also give you better reliability properties. Uh, but from perspective of clients, the most important thing is uh, 
one and four are similar in the sense that when you reconnect, you just re-announce and it works. But one and three are dissimilar in the sense that you can get a namespace conflict when you reconnect and now you're in a, like, you don't know what to do when you reconnect and you have on application level to just replace your uh, namespace. So uh, I, I think option one or four are preferable to option three in that regard. And uh, uh, that's what matters for the publishers. Okay, thanks. Uh, Luke, last word. Yeah, I, I think it's really important that they're, the two announcements are bitwise identical. Um, there's another case here that I don't think we're talking about, which is when um, the publisher crashes and starts a new instance that is not bitwise identical and re-announces the same namespace. That shouldn't be treated as, you know, like transferable, uh, as in the previous announce needs to go away. Um, I, I almost, I think, I think um, Victor proposed this at one point, but I'd like to see a token when you announce. You send a token, and if you send that same token with the second announce, it's treated as binary equivalent, and then the relay can choose which path it wants to use. But if you want to make a new token, it's a new session, it's a new broadcast, and it's relays find error or, or pick whichever one then. Okay. So, in the, thank you. In the interest of time, we will move. Or is there something from the chat or you want to relay to? So in the interest of uh, what will we do for the next thing, it sounded like there was some interest in seeing at least this is permitted at the mock layer. And if it's permitted at the mock layer, but the application wants to disallow it, or the relay wants to disallow it for policy reasons, uh, then we need facilities for that. And it sounds like the two facilities we would need is an error code to say, sorry, you lose, and a mechanism to decide what you lose, how it determines who loses. Uh, what's currently on there for options is last announced wins. Several people have suggested replacing that with a token because that would then also allow you to distinguish between the case of um, a newer, sorry, uh, a replacement from the original publisher, even though it's on a different instance. So my proposal is that we don't disallow this at the mock layer for the next draft, right? Well, not permanently, but for the next draft, we don't disallow this at the mock layer. We do add the announce error code and a token, and then uh, the token can be either used as a tiebreaker in the same way BGP uses tokens uh, or uh, for this replacement functionality. Is there anybody who's going to fall on a sword if that's the next draft? Seeing no sharp objects, let's move on. Okay, yeah, sounds good. And yeah, we can continue discussing the issue in PR. Okay, oh my gosh, how is this one gonna go quickly? Maybe it'll go quickly. Does relay matching behavior need to be negotiated in band? Maybe this has been overtaken by events. I think I wrote these slides before Monday. Um, so uh, drafter one is a little bit vague about how a relay is supposed to match, subscribe, and announce. And uh, the question, the options I thought were we can continue to leave it vague, we can mandate a behavior, which is that you match the, which I think is maybe where we ended up Monday. We match the exact bits in the namespace, and that's how you know where you're going. But we could define something like longest prefetch or concatenation is off the table now, we can do something else. Or we could make multiple behaviors and negotiate between them, but maybe this is OBE. Ian? Ian's about Google. Yeah, I suggest we go with 2A to align our, with our decision on Monday. And I, I would go with Ted's statement, of, unless someone's going to die on that sword, like, let's just do it and see how it works. Anybody yeah. want to die on a sword right now? Seeing no. <laughs> For option 2A. Wait, Colin, go back. I, I, I'm not, I, I, so we agreed on Monday that we were going to do bitwise compare. Right. Right. Um, the, the current behavior then for the next one will be bitwise compare, which is 2A, and that we're not revisiting that to add renegotiation because of this issue. That's the conclusion. We treated it as OBE by the previous decision to do bitwise compare. Right. Right. So we don't need this. Is yes. It so, would basically. Okay. That, that's I, I. I agree with the conclusion. I got confused on what you guys were proposing. Sorry. The proposal is two A. The draft will say a relay will take the namespace from subscribe, match it against a table with bitwise compare from the, the the answers, and find the one with a bitwise namespace that matches and route the subscribes there. Or if there's more than one, see previous issue. It figures out its own way to figure out. Okay. Great, okay, last issue, and we can move on to something else. Subscriber rejecting announce. Uh, I think this one Luke filed, um, but listed a few different use cases. Um, so right now when you announce, um, 
you get an announce okay or an announce error. But if you get an announce okay and then sometime later the uh, relay decides that it doesn't, it's going to drop your announce out of the table, um, do we need to add another message to do this? So there are some use cases here, like auth has changed and you want them to reconnect and revalidate with new auth. Um, another publisher came in, see a couple issues ago, uh, or like for moderation or something. Okay, so should we add some other message uh, to um, let the publisher know that its announce has dropped out of the table? Luke. Yeah, and I'm just gonna say, this is mostly for like telling OBS that it's not publishing anything anymore. Uh, I don't think there's any way of doing that right now other than closing the connection. What about unsubscribe? Um, it'd be nice to sell OBS as an error. Your, your announce is no longer valid. Luke, can I clarify? That's in a case where wherever OBS is pointed has never subscribed because otherwise unsubscribe would tell it. Well, um, unsubscribe doesn't have an error code true. anymore. So an unsubscribe could be, you know, through no fault of the, the publisher. This is telling the publisher, like, you thought you were authorized to send this and you thought you were publishing twitch.tv slash kixelated, but you're not anymore. You know, do something about it. Okay. And, and, you, and closing the session is too drastic? Uh, well, the idea is that you could be publishing multiple broadcasts. Uh, That's the whole point of announce, right? And one sure. of them might be closed, but the other one's not. Okay. All right. So you think we need this message? I'm going to assume yes. OK. I, I'm going to plus yeah, one. Yeah, I mean, there. I found the issue. <laughs> I think we need the message. message. OK. I, I, I think we should just have a sort of general design principle here, which is when we have a message that creates state on the other side, the other side has some way of saying, I'm blowing that state away, and here's, me, and here's some hints of what you could do about it if there's anything that's useful to recover from it. And I prefer not to use closed session as the result for every single error, because you just don't get enough information about what's going on. It's not really recoverable. So I think that should just be a sort of general high level design principle for dealing with subscribes uh, and announces because okay. they both create state on the other side and we're, we're sort of getting there. All right, sounds good. Okay, uh, more people in the queue? If you, anybody wants to get in and say, we don't need this message. Well, <laughs> So to comment on your point about the tying announce and subscribe together, they're decoupled. Announce says, I'm, I'm a source for this, but I'm not gonna do anything till I get a subscribe. Yeah. So your point about, well, if you get a subscribe, it really doesn't matter. It's like, you've said I'm a source, the other side's agreed, and now the other side's unagreeing from that. So you, you don't have to stand by to publish. Yeah, I see. Okay, anybody else? No, okay, so yes, we need this, needs PR. I think that's it. I think then, Will, you might be up. Uh, this is catalog format, right? Yeah. But I've uploaded three of them. It's the last one. Did you put, did you put V3 on any of them? Or? No, go to the next slide, and I can tell you if it's the latest. Uh, this is not the latest, no. It's got V3 in the actual file name. Uh, okay, so. Is it in the audio? And I have to go into admin, upload my slides, and. It, it is a go up. I saw it be, no, up, up on this list here. Okay. There's a V3. Well, while we're getting the slide, so we're switching subject over to the common catalog format now, which is the next level of interop up for those who choose to use it. It's not required at all for mock transport, but we're trying to make it a common basis for the streaming formats that will sit on top of mock transport. Okay. 
Okay, that's good. Thank you. So what I want to cover in the time today, there's two PRs. I want to go over them, uh, explain what they are, we, and debate whether uh, we should you know, accept them or not. And then followed by three different proposals. So let's go to the next slide. So the first one here is something that came in from Mike English, a proposal to adopt a JSON patch or merge as an alternate. So in the initial version of catalog update, we described our uh, a custom ability to update the JSON state of the file. Uh, and Mike pointed out that there's two RFCs we could use for this, JSON patch, JSON merge, they're listed there. Patch uh, is basically a very simple list of instructions, operations that you perform against the file. Um, it does reference arrays by indices, which I think is a weakness, but I'll, 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 I'll show you it on a different slide. And there's multiple libraries available for this. So we have a deterministic way of behavior we can expect. JSON merge patch, kind of similar. It basically creates a diff file. You can't change keys to null, but more important for me is the array elements cannot be manipulated. You have to resupply the entire array. And in our catalog, the tracks are described in an array. And what we might want to do is have many tracks and only change one of them. So I really don't like the JSON merge uh, weakness on that part. So I wrote a PR implementing JSON patch. Next slide. So what would it look like? On the left is what it looks like currently. This is a Delta update. So you've got a big fat catalog. You just want to change a little part of it. In this case, we want to add a slide track to a video conference. So on the left-hand side is how we do it today. On the right-hand side is what it would look like uh, with JSON patch. There's an operation that says add, and there's a, the tracks. We're putting it in as the last element. That's what the dash means. And then we give it the object that we want to place in there. So two things to note. First is that there's no more sequence or parent sequence number. This was another parallel request. Um, we can rely on the object sequence number that's there, and we rely upon reliable delivery of uh, catalogs. It does mean that we, with the prior system, we could have a, a tree-based relationship. We didn't have to have a delta from the immediate prior object, but I think in most cases, that's probably what we want anyway. So that it, by removing sequence and parent numbers, we make our update slightly smaller, but we, um, we lose the ability to fork the, the patching. But that's what it would look like uh, over, uh, as a client would receive it. Next slide. And here's what it looks like removing three tracks. So on the left is what we have currently. We actually reference the tracks by name, audio, video, and slides. On the right-hand side, you reference it by indices. So you can remove the, the third one, the second one, and the first one. It's zeroth based. But if you read the spec, it also says that when you remove an item from the beginning, it should bump the other two up. So in fact, the same operation, you can just go track zero, track zero, track zero, you'll get to the same state. I don't like that as much as explicit um, referencing, but there, there isn't an, a, a name-based match for an element inside JSON patch. So it's, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. The same producer of the original catalog is making the patcher, so it just keeps track of the indices. It's just a software problem. It's not anything other than that. Next slide. Whoa. Okay, let's go back. So. Just before we go to the next issue, just a quest, are there any ob immediate objections to this or improvements? Should we use JSON patch basically, yes or no? To us? Uh, I'm not saying yes or no, but I think uh, without an experiment uh, experience in implementing even the catalog, it's very hard to say if JSON patch makes big difference that if, if it's, it's improving something, I, I, can, uh, I can see why we should not pick it up. Uh, but a couple of libraries that I, we used did not have this support either. The few libraries, yes, but not the common libraries that were used in our code base. So uh, I, I, I would, my, if, uh, my proposal would be we should wait on this before we decide. Come with an experience for an extra drop and see if it makes sense. But not against good idea or bad idea. It's just okay. But when you say we, I, I don't think we can defer this. We do. You, are you saying that we go with the current patch update mechanism described in the catalog for yeah. for next imp, for implementation? That that would what I would try first though. Okay. Uh, 
I inserted myself in the queue as an individual, but to save time, I'm not going to run up there, which is just to say I, I tend to have a preference to reuse stuff. And so I kind of like the other one better, but I'm also not super opinionated. Um, we were just talking about a case where two different publishers could be like updating to the server, right? So is there a case where they might like both of them are trying to update the, the catalog because they're trying to add different tracks and they might lose track of what index a track is and they accidentally remove the wrong um, wrong track from the catalog later on? Yeah, I think you raise a very good issue. We would we would just as, we always build these things assuming I'm on a, a single source producer, but we just raised the case of I've got redundant producers and what happens to my uh, catalog updates. I would want in that case, I would want a fresh catalog. So catalog has a as a group boundary. I would want the new as as soon as the producer realizes it's primary, it should update a, 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 a independent catalog, right? Stop doing Delta updates because it doesn't really know or trust the prior state. So then we'll have to have a mechanism for the producer to, to notify find out it. Yeah, I think that's, an in, that's a consequence of that. Uh, the producer might want to know that it's now primary. Um, and that's difficult too. So maybe we should also think about a mechanism of what are if they're two updates, is it just a race? First one wins and you get into some weird condition with your indices. I think that's very possible. Uh, so uh, I'm going to lock the queue in a moment. So if you're planning on having an opinion on this, please join the queue now. Uh, Luke. Uh, yeah, just reuse existing standards. Like I, I do like the, the what we have more, but at the same time, it's like not invented here. <laughs> just, just use the existing RFC. Okay. Mike. Mike. Yeah, uh, so I open this uh, issue. So I am in favor of reusing the existing RFC. Um, I do have a question though, um, which would be, uh, how much do we lose in omitting the sequence number? Um, and do we maybe want to nest the patch like within some other structure. Um, so the actual operations are defined by, you know, this existing standard, um, but we could have, you know, additional metadata on top of that. So I, I originally was a fan of sequence number. That's why I put it in. There were some detractors though. So whoever asked for sequence number to be removed, if they want to speak up, I mean, it's a var int, it's not a big thing. Um, and it gives flexibility. There's a queue, it's over there. Oh, there is. Uh, oh, there it is. Uh, that was Mike. Uh, Colin and Luke are in the queue. So, uh, Colin, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sort of, okay, I, I fall, I'm, I'm in the same thing as Luke a little bit of not invented here. Like if there's some stuff to do this, we can use it. Um, I do know with JSON patching that, you know, one of the great things about it is, is every time everyone's tried it, it hasn't really worked. And that's why we keep getting a new way of doing it each time we try to do it, uh, <laughs> which does give me a little bit pause for thought. Uh, but I'm sort of, the thing that's really bothering me is like, do we need this at all? Like a patch is a compression technology because something is too big. Um, in this sort of case, it's not a complexity gain here. So I, I, we just, and I thought that we had these hierarchical different tracks so that you could arrange your catalog so that you didn't have to write out a huge, huge catalog each time you updated a part of it. Um, so I think I'm not, not knowing enough about how complicated uh, catalogs are in the traditional streamed media world. Okay, so I take this with a huge grain of salt. Um, I would just ask the question, do we, do we need this? Does this really help us? And if there's a case where we really need it, then yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in. It doesn't okay. matter that my case doesn't need it, I'm in for it. But I do wonder whether we really need it or we could just send the full catalog every time we updated it. Or so the fraction. Can I answer that quickly? Yeah. Because I think, yes, you don't have to use Delta Uplate. So if your catalog is of a size where you would just happily reissue it every single time there's a change, then you do that. But there are conceivable use cases where I'm describing a thousand tracks and I'm changing two. I really don't want to repeat the 998 every single time. And that's a use case. I could be updating a, th a 3D world and I have to describe vertices all over the place or different tracks. It's, I think we need to create, we need to allow for it and allow an efficient mechanism to do it. But if your use case doesn't need it, then by all means, don't use it at all. Issue discrete independent catalog updates. 
I see. I was thinking that I was going to have to implement it even if I didn't use it. But I guess your point, if my application never uses it. Your application know. knows your producer will never yeah. produce it, um, then yes. But if but in a streaming look, format, if, if we say it should be supported and you support the streaming format, you're going to have to. L let me just back up. I said I didn't understand the use cases that drove this. And if there was good ones that people thought like we needed the compression, okay. then I support it. That's where I am. I support okay. doing it. OK. OK. Um, as a conclude, I was asked not to use martial metaphors anymore, so I'm going to ask it this way. Uh, is there anybody who uh, will have an allergic reaction if Jason Patch gets folded into the mock stew? Oh, yeah, definitely. I'm always allergic to Jason, but I can live with it. <laughs> okay. So uh, allergic, but not anaphylactic. Okay, good to know. So uh, at this okay. point, it's your discussion. Okay, because we'll merge it. Um, move on. Next slide. Okay, number two. Again, this is... Cullen's not going to like this one, but um, you don't need to use it. This is for those who want to use common encryption and CMAF, which is a lot of, there's a big industry out there today. Currently, we have no encryption DRM or protection description. So the original post, if you look at issue 28, says, how do we provide this? To provide this, I'm proposing the following fields be added to the catalog. Um, you don't need to read through all the text right now, but these are the same fields that we use in HLS and Dash today to supply encryption parameters, or at least what I believe we do. So I'm, what I'm looking for is people who actually use this on a daily basis for DRM to say, no, this is insufficient or unnecessary. Victor, do you want to comment on, on this slide before I go to the next one? Um, oh, uh, I, is, is this a slide for the same issue? Yeah, I think I got a few slides for this issue. Okay. Uh, Do you want to? Yeah. Yeah. So go back one slide to the picture. Yeah. So what I'm adding is a new top level root array. Right now, we just have a track array or an array of catalogs. We're adding a new one, which is a content protection array, and it holds a bunch of content protection elements. These are all optional. It doesn't have to be there, but if it's there, this is what it looks like. Next slide. And we also get inheritance to make it efficient, because one thing I hate about Dash is this very verbose repeating of, of PSSH blobs. So on the left-hand side, we've got a content protection array, red, green, and blue, and we've got tracks that use some combination of red, green, and blue. Like maybe the blue's white vine, and one of them, two of them don't use white vine. So on the right-hand side, you can declare your uh, content protection uh, elements at the root, and then they're inherited by all the tracks. And if the track redefines its content protection, then it overwrites that inheritance. So we can be clean and efficient about this information, some of which can be verbose um, for the key IDs and things like that. And here's an example actually implemented. The text might be a bit small, but this is a catalog with common encryption DRM info. You can see on the left-hand side, I got the new content protection array, and it's got a bunch of content protection entries. And then on the right-hand side, in the purple right at the top, it's, it, that's the root, right? It's saying, hey, every content protection entry has an ID, and it's just saying that IDs 1, 2, and 3 apply to all the tracks. And then the very first track says, no, I disagree with that. I'm only content protection one and two. But actually those content protection one, two, and three, all the other tracks inherited. So I think this is a pretty concise way of applying content protection that is common encryption compatible to our catalog spec. So we have a comment from the, um, the chat uh, from James. I think the key system specific fields should be replaced with some more open fields that are agnostic. Also, is this using the dash list of UUIDs for key system ident? Should that be in IAN and an IANA registry? Um, so I think this is specific to CMAP though, right? So uh, Yeah. I would so clearly my example I cut and paste out of a dash file that I happen to have, but I don't I'm not sure that the schema, the scheme ID is generic. It doesn't have to be dash. It's just a field called scheme ID. So if these fields, I, I agree, we should have generic fields, right? The streaming format can map explicit fields over to these generic ones. Um, so the goal should be that these fields are as generic as possible. And I think key ID, scheme ID, maybe PS, certainly PRO for the, for the Microsoft one, that's very play ready specific. So we should just have a, extended field DRM field number one and 
in the spec says if it's play ready, you put your pro uh, blob in there. So I, I would support that actually. Okay, let's go to Q. Oh, wait, let's go to final slide because it's got explicit questions that maybe people can answer. So yeah, are these sufficient to describe it? Should they be added to the common catalog or defined separately in a streaming format spec? What does lock need? We, want to, we would ideally have elements so, so generic that other container formats can apply their own content protection. And is there a cleaner way to do this? Those are my questions. So who's for Q? Victor. Oh, uh, yeah, I guess my answer, my comment would be mostly on the question two, and the answer is specifically for if, specifically for DRM, I don't believe it should be in the common catalog since there, it's a very specific use case in like in set of all media over quick use cases, and most of them don't require content protection. That said, we should our like inheritance model for tracks and fields should be sufficiently generic that something like this would be able to be embedded and just work without uh, like any additional effort. And like, what I mean by this is we should have enough extensibility that this should be put in and we should make sure that. Now, uh, there might be some rule, uh, some room in the common catalog for general purpose encryption. So you can define how you encrypt and that would be on top of whatever container you choose. And that is entirely plausible. But one, I am not sure that is actually would meet requirements of DRM, uh, of all DRM vendors. And two, uh, it is unclear to me that this is the correct layer compared to the container itself. Okay. Look, yeah, just wanted to second everything Victor says. Um, this is a really good uh, use case for actually just testing how extensible the common catalog format is. Um, I it should be totally feasible to define this in like a CMAF specific draft um, without barely making a super generic, all DRM schemes must use this in the future in the common catalog uh, thing. So yeah, we should do it. I just, I just matters which draft this goes into. Okay. Um, I think I shared my concerns with this earlier with you, Will. Um, uh, the, spe the things that are very specific to DRM, I would assume that would be either a catalog extension draft for CMF, if, if that's what it would be, or it could be in the container uh, or the streaming format draft. But if you want to define something very specific, uh, a generic way to say, uh, this is the encryption scheme that you're using. Uh, and, and if you want to learn more about this encryption scheme, go to the extension spec, that should be okay. Uh, loading the common catalog with something very specific to a, one particular use case is no more, no more common, okay? I, I know the queue's closed, but I'm going to add a comment that I think the chairs might care about for a second on this one. Okay, but Mo's before you, so oh. Mo. I agree with Victor that this probably doesn't belong in a common catalog, and I think it's a good exercise to figure out how we do the streaming format specific uh, extensions um, and how those are separated from the com common catalog, because I don't see this being used outside of CMAF. Whatever we do, let's make sure we don't need a normative reference to a document the ISG can't get, because that always causes approval problems. Yeah. So I think... We've heard pretty consistent feedback that this should not be part of catalog draft, that we should make sure there's enough extensibility in catalog draft that a separate streaming format can create, can, it can normatively create elements that the streaming format should use within common catalog. So I'm actually fine with that. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll drop this PR and I'll go back and I'll make up a sample use case with extensibility to see if we are actually extensible enough to carry this. Next slide. So PR34, this one got a lot more approval. This is allowing relative track names in an inherited namespace. So the current catalog as it stands says you must put the namespace in there, must be declared, because it's pretty central to our discovery mechanism and our routing. However, this introduces the notion that it's optional and that if it's absent, the tracks in the catalog inherit the, na the namespace of the catalog because the catalog is itself a track. Um, 
And this provides some very nice encapsulation features, I believe, and it's something I strongly advocate we support. So I gave an example there, you just audio and video, and you inherit the namespace of the catalog, which is visible to the client uh, and also to the relay. Next slide. Okay, I didn't have a question slide, so I'll just go back to that slide. Any, any objections to allowing relative track names? I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear. You actually don't have a match there, and several people have asked if that's intentional or a mistake. It's almost certainly a, ty uh, a typo. Sorry, yeah, this was late at night. Um, it's, it's meant to be a match. Oh, just Should be Premier Gaming. Just a clarification question. So um, when we do the client subscribe, the we should say that the last catalog piece should be removed when you construct the track name, the string catalog from that. Yes. That has to be specified in the track. If not, yeah. they take the entire thing on slash audio. So the catalog draft says that the reserved name of the catalog track is catalog. So it knows what to remove. Um, streaming formats, I think, are free to overwrite that with their own reserved name. But either way, it should be clear what is the track name of the catalog. Because it might be gamer34 slash catalog. And that should be okay. Sorry, uh, a clarifying question then. So uh, from the full track name, I mean, I took this as when you, wherever the catalog was, it's in some namespace. Yeah. It and you already know has what that namespace. namespace is. And let's not make any assumptions about the slashes or anything else. We know what the namespace Those is. Those are has tuples or tuples or tuples, examples. right? Yeah. 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 Okay. There's good. some tuple there that you have some knowledge of via some mechanism. You just inherit it. Yeah. Okay. We got thumbs up. Next one. So I'll merge that. Um, Bitrate definition. This question came in from Ali. So right now we say bitrate, right? There's, it's a murky swamp when every, we have a number called bitrate. If you look at what I put in, what HLS defines, put in what dash defines, I put in what web codex defines. They're all sort of ambiguous. What I think we should do is have two placeholders, average bitrate and peak bitrate. Those would at least give you some idea, but Cullen's already shaking his head, so maybe we just have bitrate and then it's application defined. But there was, you know, we've had problems with this in the past if you've got highly variable bitrates. And do we at this point want to take the time to describe or at least communicate the variability that's inherent in the track? Um, I just want to say we've we've got delta updates. We can actually do better than HLS and Dash, and we can update the bitrate periodically with a with a catalog update. Because um, that's one of the issues with HLS and Dash is you have to specify at front I will never send higher than this because I don't know what it's going to be. Um, but I think we can actually avoid this and make it a lot easier and actually support VBR because HLS and Dash don't support VBR as a result. It would mean that your delta update period would need to be smaller than the rate at which your, your bit rate's varying, which would be a pretty fast update. But you're right, it's, we can do that. Hero? Hero Meta. Uh, just uh, kind of from experience, right? So uh, on Meta side, we have a bunch of different bit rates. Right, so there's max bitrates, uh, there's also average bitrate, and also over what window that average bitrate is. So there's, I, I don't know if you want, like, do we want to list all of those bitrates? <laughs> well, that's the question. Catalog, yeah, right? based on your experience, what would you like to do here to minimize future pain? I don't want to, I, I want to be flexible, right? So because I don't want to restrict, like, hey, just publish average bitrate, right? So I want, like, tomorrow we'll find, like, hey, there is a new, way or like the, there is better way to compute the bitrate right so like or type of bitrate right so maybe using something else right so like i don't want i, I don't want to specify what it what that is necessarily okay so to be clear are you calling you're calling for more fields but not the fields proposed here i 
I'm not sure if we need to specify the, can it be like just, can we, can we not send like custom field, like application yes. level? Yes, so the catalog right? allows custom fields. So maybe we do like, you have a bitrate, that's it, but then you can have a, Whatever you com want. Com .meta dot yeah, custom but, custom VBR measure but, and. But then why would you have bit, like just bitrate field at all? I guess you could. Well, it, we got to draw a line. The whole thing yeah. can be custom, right? It, yes, we right. want at some point people want to write a parser that generally works for stuff. So we should we should pick the subset of fields that most applications are going to use. And those are part of the catalog standard. And they're, they're optional, right? You don't have to use them. But if you do use them, there should be a defined definition of what, what the value is and how it's calculated. So I'd be fine with single bitrate and then let's do cust use custom fields until everyone's using the same custom field and then we, we fold it in, something like that. Colin. Um, I think to have an interoperability, which is the point here, you can't really have custom fields. You do need to define this. Now, you might define later better fields with more detailed sort of measurements of various types that more advanced clients might use. But I think we do need to nail this. Um, and what I was laughing at, I mean, like, we do need some sort of, there's many systems have defined this many ways, a different level of precision. I think the most important, and, and spent incredible amount of time arguing about which about what this is all mean. I think we should point at one of the existing definitions, right, and, and say what it is. I think that we do need the average and the max thing. I will point out the max bit rate of a server with a 400 gig card in it is always 400 gigs, right? So it's like defining how you measure max is, is always has that element of time to it and variability and like you can see how that gets really complicated fast, right? So we this is the encoded bit rate, not the throughput to be clear. Media encoding bitrate. Yeah, I, I understand what's, uh, but you know this that you can you know is that anyway yeah. per frame. You know what I mean? Like the yeah. timeline that you're measuring on that's really important. So there's all kinds of definitions. We just need. I think that we should. This is like who, what matters is that we all that our clients understand which one they're using, and yeah. so we should assign. Ali to come back to us with what is the best one for us to use. He, he knows both worlds. He's seen all of this. He's laughing at me already. He's like, there's, no, I tried that and, uh, he's like, yeah, there's yeah. no right answer to this question. That's what we need. The guy who knows there's no right answer should bring us back the best worst answer <laughs> um, and we should yeah. go with it. Oh, okay, just uh, I'll remind cool. people that we're actually pretty tight on time. Okay. We've got Ali, Jonathan and Mo and I've logged the queue. Um, so please be brief. So I'll just, also are we in, getting close to bike shed territory? Just wondering. This is a rat hole, not a bike shed. Oh, yeah, I sorry. think I'm getting a feedback that we, we need more discussion, that we, yeah, so there's I'll no keep clear. It very short. I think uh, this is one really exact use case for sparse metadata track. Uh, if you are really worried about your bitrate variation over time, you can certainly signal this in a separate metadata track, which actually what we are doing in Dutch now. Yeah. So, we don't, I mean, we have, certainly have these values in the manifest, but those are not sufficient for, uh, yeah. you know. Jonathan. I, yeah, Jonathan Lennox, just to, in case things are more complicated enough. Um, <laughs> I, insofar as we have objects within a track that are discardable by the relay, do we want to be able to specify the bandwidth both of the, you know, without the discardable and with the discardable so you can know, you know, you know what you can successfully squeeze into the, bit, the bandwidth you have available? That's a good point. Uh, I think we should keep this catalog very simple. First of all, the relay can't even see this. So this is not something that would be relevant for yeah. relay processing. Um, this is really for the endpoints. And for the endpoints, uh, like I said, there's a, a lot more metadata that's needed than just this. So I think keeping the catalog simple with a simple max bit rate that's well-defined, you know, sliding window over one second, never exceeds, the network bandwidth never exceeds this bit rate over sliding window of one second. That's a traditional definition adding anything else is not useful for the person consuming this. And it's not gonna be sufficient for the ones that really need very tight control over per frame level uh, bit allocations. That's good. Okay, so okay. Uh, one thing uh, I did hear uh, several people suggest that there be a metadata track for updates to uh, things like this. Now, if somebody wants to produce a PR about that, that would be separate from this bit rate definition, please. Uh, Find well, if you go to the next slide, we'll oh. see what I think a metadata track looks like, sort of. Uh, this is different. I don't know. We have time for how much time? We just have a few minutes. Uh, yeah, we're, 
Okay, I'm, I'm gonna, whose issue was this? Oh, this? This was a suggestion that we put catalog fields in an IANA registry and Let, not- Let's skip this one. Yeah, okay. Let's go to this next one. This is how does a client learn about group numbers, right? Um, we're all focused on the live edge where you, you sort of don't care. You care, you get the latest thing. But as we go into sports media and other objects, we have a timeline, a five hour window, and I wanna go back and watch a particular part of it. I need to discover the relationship between group number and object number and media time and wall clock time. So I'm proposing that there's a, a notion of a timeline track. Um, and it's, well, firstly, there's the use cases of why we need this information. And I list them there. There's also some ways to achieve this. We can use the catalog and update it. But this list could have 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 entries. We, we don't want it, I don't think, baked in every catalog. We can use a template mechanism so the client can predict a deterministic relationship between these. And that's, you can do it, but it's very inflexible for other formats. And then the third option is adding a timeline track that clients subscribe to if and when they want to understand the history of group numbers and time. So if we go to the next slide, it would be no more complex than, I'm showing it in JSON, it wouldn't be JSON, it would be a binary compacted file that is just listing group number, war clock time, and media PTS. So a client could start playback by subscribing just to the last object of this life edge. This is itself a, a track that has Delta updates. Um, but if it needed to build a, a scrub line or need to build its UI or needed to go back, it would go and grab the whole timeline track. The moment it didn't need it, it would stop subscribing to it. Um, so I think the notion of a timeline track is interesting. I'm just looking for feedback on that. Okay. And this is for warp streaming format, by the way. Mock transport doesn't care. It's just a track. It delivers it like any other. So we're talking about key attributes of a streaming format now. Yeah, perhaps you, you will need also DDS, depending, because on, on the wire, the frames are ordered by DDS. Depending on the group, if the group is a go, probably you won't need it. If the group is a frame, you probably will need it. Just saying that okay. probably adding that DDS. Do you need will, will PTS and DTS? And DTS, okay. Yes. Uh, it, it doesn't seem like um, it's probably necessary to, to specify something like this because I think different uh, different applications may want to implement their their timelines in different ways. So I don't really see a need to have a standard for this because applications may choose to encode their timelines and, and they may choose not to need it. They may be parsing the object uh, headers anyway and understanding the actual PTS and seeing the object group mappings from that. But there's no way an application can know about older group numbers that it hasn't seen. I agree, but I, I I don't think that I don't think there needs to be one simple one single way to do it because other applications may decide to encode that information in different ways. Understood, but what we're talking about is warp, which is an attempt to create a interoperable standard that players and producers can work on independently. And in that case, there has to be a consistent way to discover this history of group objects. So right, but, that's but, what this is about. But warp is all CMAF applications, right? that's a big space and there's many people already, CMAF has already delivered today in many different ways, right? HLS dash and whatnot. So there's already different ways to encode that information in, in those CMAF applications. So, so Mo, we, we we're really running low on time. Let me ask you this question. Would, would adding this for testing in the next uh, iteration of the, the draft cause you any heartburn? Wouldn't cause me any heartburn. I just think it may be unnecessary to specify. Okay, okay. Uh, then let's go on. Luke? Um, I, I think this is, you need to specify this for DVR. I, you need this, um, you say application specific, but I don't want to implement a DVR on per app. I, I want to have, you know, <laughs> a player that supports DVR regardless of which website I use. Oh, and uh, this would be a good place to put the max bit rate. In fact, we could put any objects that's changing, any attributes changing over time. Okay, that was okay, it. Okay, that's the end of this one. What do you want next? Do you have a just a general call? I would we we brought the catalog repo in from a private repo into mock WG. So the call would be, can we adopt it, and then work on it? Um, 
the threshold for adoption is that it's a reasonable place to start, not it's that it's the best or it's in even looking like the end. But that's a, that's a chair base. Uh, so we had, I mean, at the interim when the catalog was presented, there was um, very strong support among the group that was there. Uh, that catalog is a reasonable starting point. Uh, I'm not sure if there's there anybody here who was not in the interim who has read the draft and does not think it's a reasonable starting point. It's too complicated for the end of the week. Um, I, I'm going to put it in a different way. I think uh, if you're going to merge your recent set of updates, feedback from this meeting, publish another version, ask the chairs to call for adoption, and we will. And if you do not support adoption, we'll see you on the list. Uh, so parameter reform is next. Martin Duke, parameter reform. How? 10 minutes. Four slides, 10 minutes from one man to enter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mean, absolutely stunned, uh, Martin Duke, that I'm actually getting to present this. Uh, that, so there are just a note from Spencer in the chat. He wants to make sure that at least we discuss how many interim meetings we need before the next meeting. So the, the, the little thing underneath that was a sarcasm marker in case you didn't see that. Okay. Um, there are three kind of, so we, we fixed a lot of the parameter stuff. There are three kind of lurking issues that um, frankly I could live with anything on any of these, but I think we just need to decide. Um, one is a link this mismatch. We've, we've thankfully gotten rid of like 39 byte integers and, and now integers are variants. Um, but of course there's a link field and there's a link field in the variant. And so like they could be different. Um, uh, one solution is something Victor proposed a while ago, which is just have like a, like a, a bit in the type field that tells you like if it's a variant or not. And if it is a variant, the link field is eliminated. Um, and therefore there's no possibility of a mismatch. Um, a lot of people didn't like that. So it's not in the draft today. Uh, what the draft says today that is that if you detect a mismatch that, that you ignore the parameter and keep going um, using the link field that's the link field, not the variant length. Um, and the reason for that, which is like kind of aesthetic is that it is annoying to have. Um, so if you don't understand parameter, that is what you're going to do. And if, if you do understand the parameter, have like different behavior is, is like sort of, um, it's like harder to write and, and a little harder to reason about, as I would think. Uh, I think Luke, Luke made a counter argument to this that you might have some weird behavior, unexpected behavior if this happened. But um, I don't know, what do people think? Yeah, it's about Google. I actually think this is a bigger footprint than I realized because this is not so dissimilar from like HTTP on content length encoding sort of like masking issues where like I can throw down an invalid length and get you to skip over stuff and maybe you handle it differently if you understand parameters versus don't. Like I'm not sure I can actually construct an attack immediately, but like it gives me the heebie-jeebies. Um, so I'd rather get rid of it. Okay, thank you. Victor. Yeah, uh, uh, one thing I do want to say is uh, I am really unhappy with any format where we can like add random data to the fields that we do not have any use or how to interpret. We've systematically avoided that in quick, and we should not allow that in the queue. I'm sorry, what? Oh, because by having a link greater than the variant length, you can put more you can like smuggle data in somehow. Okay. So you're arguing to go to the two, number 256, which is to like remove the link field. So it's impossible to have this error. Oh, uh, either remove the length field or error out if you, or if your length mismatches. Okay. All right. Well, that, that would, okay. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, Colin? Uh, to be really quick, it seems like you're thinking there's a bunch of stuff that's agreed on here. I don't think it is, and I might be getting the wrong context of where these could be happening. So there's places where we have to pass un, where we have to parse unknown parameters for extensibility reasons, right? Yes. And then there's all the other places where you're in a field that you know the type of already. Like we're not going to have double lengths for we're not going to for things where we know what the type is. We're not going to be doing this, right? Am I? No, that's not correct. So okay, as so it, I, I think I think we should schedule a bunch of let's on a design call, spend an hour on this because that, that makes no <laughs> sense at all. I, I'm sure we're talking past each other. Um, so a variant has a length in it, obviously. Yes, right. Yeah. Um, there was a proposal to like have a, a like a, a some voodoo in the type bit so that 
if it was a variant, there would be no length field. Um, so, but, but I mean, if I if 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 I have a type, if if I'm parsing a structure that has ten variants in it, and I know the type of the of the structure, right? yes. We're not going to have a type between each one of before each one of those variants. That's I think where we're talking past each other. I mean, that'd be no, 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 no. This is for setup and for track for, request for, parameters. For only for the parameters in the setup. Then. Well, I mean, there's also the, a track is... request parameter right now, but that's that's a different okay. thing. Okay. But it, parameters can be unknown, so there has to be an overall length field to skip them. Um, there's also a length encoded in the actual value in the case of variant. So they could be different okay. and we have to pro we handle that case okay. as it stands. Okay, I okay. agree we All needed right. it in that case and I was got confused okay. on the other cool. one. Okay, cool. Luke? Uh, yeah, this is, this is a foot gun. So if a client thinks a parameter is a variant, but the server thinks it's a string, uh, this text will basically say that the server must ignore it um, and just pretend like it never happened because it'll be a length mismatch. Um, so I, I think that if, if you have two implementations that know about a parameter but implement them wrong, it, it just causes you to silently ignore errors, is what this text says. And okay, I think we that, should that's another out. vote. Uh, and Christian is sat down, so uh, great. Uh, I, I, this is a clear signal that we just want to make it be an error if you identify the parameter, so I will do the linguistics to make that work. Next slide. Uh, track request parameters. So. Um, so setup parameters, I think there's a very solid case for those now with a VN text we have on why you need them. Uh, so no notes on that, uh, at least on this slide. Um, we have one parameter in all the rest of the protocol, which is authorization info for subscribe and announce. Um, uh, like we could just get rid of that with an optional field in those messages and just not have parameters and all this parameter stuff in the rest of the protocol. Um, uh, like some people have stated that actually they do see a use for message parameters. On the other hand, we have like, we can negotiate capabilities and setup. We have two to the 62 message code points. So like, I mean, I would favor just get rid of these and I think it just cleans up the document editorially a lot. And uh, what do you guys think? Again, I could live with either. Uh, Alan. Uh, yes, as an individual, uh, I like the flexibility. They look like HTTP headers. And I think that we should have them even though we only have one defined right now. Sue us. Uh, I'm probably going the other way. I'm saying because we wanted to put the hints in the parameters and we put it in the subscribe message now. Um, there's one left authorization. I'm okay to put it in the subscribe message as a field. I'm sorry, you want to leave parameters in there or no, not? Put it as a field, as an optional field. Take them out. Got it. Okay. And uh, that's it. All right. That's. Uh, okay. That we, is we actually don't have time for your last one because okay. it's 627 and we want to talk about uh, whether or not we're okay. going to have an intro. Thank you. So I'm going to flash it up so people. One thing is one thing, host. All right. Uh, it sounds like this one, currently no one seemed to agree what role is for. There will be ongoing discussion about that. If you'd like to contribute it, send something to the list. So Alan, talk to us about interim. Interim. So we uh, are thinking that another, certainly an, like interop has been very valuable and we should continue to do that. Uh, an interim I think would also be valuable before Brisbane. Um, we had, Ted and I had also discussed that maybe because of uh, travel budgets being drained for travel to Australia, that people would perhaps prefer the interim to be virtual only uh, sometime in the winter time, January, late January or early February. Um, do people have thoughts that they want to share on this plan? The interims actually give us two solid days of mock, so we get a lot accomplished in them. So if I've got scarce travel budget, I'd rather allocate it to an interim and then do a virtual IETF where we only get like 90 minutes or something. So that's my preference. Uh, Ali, then Colin, then I'll have a comment on that. I just wanted to say that uh, some of us, bunch of us will be in Denver in early February for my Thai video. And then uh, Comcast again will be happy to host a meeting if there is a need. Colin. Uh, I, my vote would be for an in-person. We just spend so much more time and we get so much more done at them. Uh, Denver would be a great location. I'm sure we could host in Seattle as well. Um, but those two, two locations come to mind. OK. Um... The, I, I will point out that if we do do an interim, this does not mean that we will not have a meeting at Brisbane. 
uh, there's actually some rules around uh, how how you can use replacements uh, interims to uh, avoid uh, travel, and they're not uh, they're there to make sure that people are not uh, disadvantaged if they come from parts of the world um, in the one 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 um, cycle. So, in particular, we've not met in uh, Asian time zones for a while, um, and uh, we can't really skip. Uh, Brisbane. So there will be Brisbane meetings. Uh, if you are not planning on coming in person, you're of course welcome to attend them uh, remotely. That's why they're hybrid. But we'll be getting up at that that time of day just just plan for it. Uh, we'll talk offline about uh, what dates look good. Um, uh, Ali, thank you for um, suggesting uh, Denver. Uh, thank you, Cullen, for volunteering uh, Sing uh, Seattle. I have outside Singapore, and that would have probably caused a lot of people problems. Um, but we'll. We'll try and figure out some dates and uh, get back to you. I think that brings us to the, unless you didn't want to. Nope, it's okay, it's 6.30, we are, you're all set. If you have a plane to catch, go grab it. Thanks for a great IETF, everybody. Um, and yeah, we'll see you at the interim and or in Australia. It's going to be in your basement. That's a short walk to my house. Well, my basement.